Hey, this is John. Thanks for joining me for this video today. In this video, I'm going to continue building Bandai's 70 second scale TIE Striker from Star Wars Rogue One. Now, if you've watched uh, the other episodes in this series, you'll know that uh, this, this build series has a dual goal. While I am showing, of course, how to uh, build and paint and weather this TIE Striker, because of the similarities in engineering between all of Bandai's TIE Fighter family kits, whether it's the original ping pong ball and two waffle irons, um, all the way through to the, the very latest uh, ones from the series, they all assemble about the same. And for the most part, except for those new order ones, um, they, they all have essentially the same coloring. So the steps that I'm going to show in the steps that I showed in the previous videos and the steps that I'm going to show in this video will be able to be applied to any of that TIE fighter family uh, with just a few adjustments for obvious, uh, for obvious reasons. But for the most part, you're talking about on all of them, a gray or bluish gray body uh, with some black panels, solar panels, and various details around a small fuselage. And so the process is going to be the same on all of them. So even if you're not building this TIE Striker, I think this video, uh, the way I'm doing it is I'm hoping that it will be helpful uh, for any of the family that you're building. Now the focus of this video is going to be, as I said, weathering. In, the, in canon, in the, in the Star Wars movies, they really weren't weathered that heavy. You didn't see... Um, when you look at the studio models or when you look at them on screen, uh, unless they were wrecked, uh, you didn't see a lot of weathering on the, the Empire's fighters. You know, when, when you looked at the, the Rebel fighters, the Alliance fighters, they were obviously beat up and dirty. I mean, they, they wanted it to look that way. They wanted to convey a sense that this was a, uh, an army on the run, so to speak, whereas the Empire was huge and had the resources to keep everything clean and in repair. So you didn't see a whole lot of weathering on any of the TIE fighters. What I'm going to do is I'm going to break this down into two phases essentially. I want to do uh, the initial pass of weathering to show, okay, if you're just wanting to do something that's more canon, that's that's more like you would have seen in the movie, a nice clean build, then, then that's what I'm going to show. There'll just be a couple of simple steps uh, to do that. And then what I want to do is go in and show how you can add to that to add what I would call plausibility. Remember, I've talked about in other videos, there's three kinds of weathering in my mind. There's realistic, if you're um, weathering a realistic object, and you have a reference to look at. There's plausible where you're weathering uh, maybe a science fiction object, but you want it to look as though it were realistic. And then there's, I, I don't know if I use the same term every time, but there's basically free form. Do what you want, you know, whether it makes sense or not. Uh, so I'm going to be doing plausible with this. So I want to show how to add to it to, to reach that target of plausibility so that it will be heavier in terms of weathering than you would see necessarily in the movie, but you'll be able to pick from the techniques that I show and hopefully some of the tips that I give about where you want to go and find the right spot for your build. Now on most TIE Fighter kits, you simply have to pull uh, the solar panels off of the side and you're done with, with deconstruction to make it easier for weathering. You don't have to weather it with them apart. I just find it easier to do that from a standpoint of handling it uh, than, than, than in leaving it together. The tie striker is a little different in that you've got this piece that each of the panels attaches to. Um, they go in right there like that. And once they're placed on here, they're kind of sandwiched in place. Now you can see that I've clipped the pegs here to make it easier to get this piece on and off. So as I'm going through the weathering, I'm just going to temporarily set that in place. And it's only loosely fit because once I push that on there, um, it'll be a little more difficult to get off. But that way I'll be able to weather this component and 
these components separately and it'll make it a little easier. All right, to start off this process, I'm gonna do what is, many people may think is an overly simplistic technique, but I like it. I'm gonna do dry brushing with my big fluffy brush here. This is just a makeup brush right here. I'm using Vallejo's Sky Gray, which is, in my opinion, a wonderful, wonderful um, color for any dry brushing. It works well on most things. Uh, it, it's not light enough to appear white. It's neutral enough that it works over a lot of things. It's dark enough that you can see it. So there's a lot of benefits. I use it a lot, but of course not exclusively. Now the reason I want to do some dry brushing is because that will help the raised detail show up. You know, if you wanted to do more of a Citadel style weathering, you could go in and do some edge highlighting. Heck, you could just do a, a little more of uh, modulation along the panels and things like that with your airbrush and then do a panel wash and get a really nice look too. But I like the way dry brushing brings out detail. And I think as the first, you know, I talked about I was going to do just some simple basic close to canon kind of weathering. Really what you're doing there is you're just making detail apparent. So with a dry brush and then later a wash, which I'll show you that of course, um, that'll bring that out. But dry brushing, if you've watched any of my videos, you've seen this, but I'll always like to demonstrate it in case somebody hasn't. I just take my brush and I dip into the paint. This is not, this is just straight from the bottle. I don't thin my paints generally when dry brushing. And I just get a little on the end like that. And I just work it around the bristles. I'm trying to get off most of the paint. Now one thing you have to remember when you're using this makeup brush, any, any large fluffy kind of brush, it's going to hold a lot of paint and that paint's going to spread up in the bristles. That's good, that's what you want, but at the same time it can mean if you're not careful when you first go into the model you can get more paint on there than you want to. Dry brushing is really a simple technique because all you're doing is literally brushing almost dry paint onto it. The only mistake you can make is having too much paint on your brush. Now one of the ways that I check for that is I just simply start on the bottom and I see how it looks and this is looking exactly like I want it. Now by using this big fluffy soft brush and I'm not really pushing hard on it you can avoid some of the brush strokiness that you get if you use a heavier, um, more aggressive brush with a heavier, more aggressive stroke. Now, if that's what you're looking for, then do it. It provides its own effect. It, in essence, almost starts the process of chipping. But I want just edge highlighting. I want just some details to come out. And so I just begin slowly building this up. And you're seeing this is not you know jumping out I'm not adding a lot of paint onto it that's very deliberate I want this to be lighter I want this to be visible um, but I don't want it to be overly dramatic so I'm doing this very slowly and just letting that color build up there and I'll continue doing this. Let me show it on the front here because it's going to be a little more contrast. I'll continue doing this until I reach the level of contrast that I'm looking for. You can see it a little better on the front there. It is imparting color because that blue-gray is so light, it's only showing it faintly. But again, that's what I want. Most of my definition is going to come from the panel line wash, not from this dry brushing. But here you can see the level of color that it's imparting onto it. It's just very faint. Okay, I've got this dry brush now. Now you may be looking at it and going, I can hardly see any of that. Yes, that's deliberate. Um, it's just very light. Uh, there were like this area here, there's you can see a little bit of contrast. 
I probably had to hit that about 25, 30 times to build it up to the level that I wanted. You can see a little more on here. It doesn't leave, doing it that lightly, doesn't leave as much strokiness as uh, you might often see with dry brushing. It's a very, very deliberate attempt to keep it moderate. You can go in with a heavier dry brush if that's, like I've said, if that's, if that's what uh, your goal is, then, then do it. But I've got that done and I'm happy with it and I'm ready to move on to the wing panels. All right, for the wing panels, I went ahead in the last episode and I had done some dry brushing on them. Um, because at the time I wasn't in entirely sure how I wanted to approach doing this dry brushing on the frame. So I went ahead and did it in there knowing that if I wanted to, I could mask it off and do this heavier. Because of the way I'm going to be doing it, I won't have to do that. But all I'm going to do here is go in and do the same process of... Um, hitting these details all along here, making sure to get both sides of it. And you can see, this is where this is where I started dry brushing last time, and you can see I had too much paint here. All I'm going to do is, uh, off camera, I'm going to go back and I'm going to repaint this with the black gray, and I'm going to go in and dry brush it again so it'll look a little cleaner. It's one of the beautiful things uh, in building a model that a lot of people don't take the time to do is if you have something that's not like you want, stop and correct it. It's generally easy to do. Uh, you paint over it, you do some additional steps, and you move on. But I'll, I'll uh, get some paint on my brush and just show you a couple of this and make some notes there. All right, now I'm going to do the same process I did before. Same brush, same color, and I'm just going to go in <clears throat> and hit those details. Now, you, you have to go at it from different angles, so you hit the different edges. Um, and, and I'm also, I am not pushing down much at all. I could, if I wanted to impart more color, let me do a hit on the underside where it won't be as visible. I could go in a lot heavier and impart color a lot more fast, a lot more faster, a lot quicker. But you'll notice you start getting, I don't know if you can see right there, you start getting that streakiness that's often associated with dry brushing. But by going in and only lightly hitting it and doing it repeatedly, it's only going to get picked up on the raised detail for the most part and it's not going to leave that streakiness. Now some areas, like there's just the tiniest ridge right there, some of those areas you can go in and you can impart some color to, but if you start to see it streaking, you want to pull back from both pressure and from potentially even doing it additionally, because remember, a wash is going to go in and define that surface, that, that distinction there, a change in elevation, I guess you'd say, um, a little better, but Again, it's just really light pressure, and you can see where I got a little heavy right there. That's okay. Um, I'm not going to worry about that. It looks fine. But less pressure means less streakiness. Less pressure means it's going to take you longer to build it up, but it also means you have much more control over the process. And for the most part, when you're building any model of any type, doing any technique that's what you're really going for is you want the technique to be controlled you don't want it to control you um, I find that happens a lot of times when I try something for the first time I feel like the technique is kind of in charge because I'm still discovering the limitations of it I know the first time I did uh, hairspray chipping that uh, you know when I understood the steps. I understood the concept. I got it to work immediately. 
but because I had no experience in it, I realized that the technique was kind of driving me, and I wasn't driving the technique. But once I had done it a few times, I knew how it worked, what you could do, what you could get away with, what, where you could be in control, where it was kind of in control, where you had to let serendipity take over a little bit, and I was able to use it effectively. So this is, this is a way of doing dry brushing that keeps you in control, where you're building it up very slowly over time to the exact point that you want it and no further. To show what dry brushing does, this one has not been dry brushed. This one has. There's only a little bit of difference, but that difference, that light contrast, when combined with washes, uh, which will be the next step, will really make that detail pop. Now, I've still got to do this one, obviously, um, because sometimes when you're, when you're doing video, you actually do a lot of things off camera. Then just to, just to spare everybody the, having to sit there and watch it. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to dry brush both sides of these solar panels, uh, just like I'd shown you here. And then the next step, of course, is going to be to apply a wash. Now, because I want this wash to flow well, and I want it to be a clean wash so that I can show you, like I talked about earlier, here's kind of a clean finish, and then here's how you can go beyond that to dirty it up. After I get through with the dry brushing, but before the wash, I'm going to put a gloss coat on this model. Now, that just I'm doing that purely to help the wash flow better and to make it easier to clean up so that I get a nice clean result. If I were not going for a, a clean result, if I were wanting to, you know, my end goal is to have this being a fairly weathered TIE fighter. If that were my end goal and I didn't have that intermediate step that I want to show, I would not bother with the gloss coat. All the gloss coat will do is help the washes that I'm going to use flow better. That's, that's all the reason I'm doing it. So don't feel like, okay, if I apply a wash, I have to use a gloss coat. Um, as, as, I, as I've said, in fact, I think I said in uh, a video that I have about applying future, um, you know, the, the gloss coat is just something that's there for the steps beyond it in general. So because I want this to flow nicely, I'm going to put a gloss coat on it. Again, if you're not wanting a nice clean look, if you're wanting to go in and do some cleanup and show some smudges and smears right off the bat, don't bother with the gloss coat. You can just go straight in over your either matte or satin finish paint. I like satin finish a little better for stuff like that, but you can make it work with matte also. So dry brush, gloss, then panel lines. Have I flogged that enough? <laughs> So, dry brush, gloss, panel lining. All right, so it's dry brush, gloss, panel lining. I think I've belabored that point enough. <laughs> Okay, <clears throat> okay, everything's been gloss coated and uh, it's ready for a wash. I used uh, Future or Pledge or Clear, uh, the floor polish on this. There's no magic about that. It's just a cheap gloss coat. Uh, if, you've, if you've wondered about uh, using that, then I have a video about that, which 
Hopefully there will be a link appearing up here about right now. If I forget though, um, just, just do a search on my channel for it and uh, about using it. If you have another kind, if you have Tamiya gloss coat or if you have rattle can gloss coat or any other gloss coat, it's the gloss coat that matters. It's not the brand. Like I said, I use Pledge because it's cheap and I've used it for years and I like it. Um, also, as I talked, I talked about in the previous segment, you know, that if you want uh, a more dirty look, you don't necessarily have to put a gloss coat. I do have um, a video where I talk about that, you know, when, when should you uh, add a clear coat. Now, it applies across genres, so if you've got questions about that, hopefully that, that will be helpful also, and there's a link to that one, if I remember, up there. So um, they may be useful. But anyway, I've got it gloss coated and I'm ready to do the panel line wash. All right, I'm gonna be using oil paints for my wash today. And what I've got here is a mix of mostly Payne's gray, which is uh, a, a bluish gray, a very dark bluish gray. And then I added in just a touch of phthalo blue because I want it to be blue. I want it to pick up the blue in the rest of the model. I don't want it to be bright blue, but I definitely want this whole model to have kind of a blue cast to it. I just think it'll look cool. Now what I've got here mixed in is the oil paints and just a few drops of odorless thinner. And this is terpenoid. This is not the enamel odorless thinner. It's terpenoid, Weber's terpenoid. Chemically, I don't know if they're any different, but I prefer to use the terpenoid. In observing them, when I've had problems with Bandai plastic, it's been with enamel thinners, not with terpenoid. I'm still very careful about what I do, but I like to use the terpenoid where possible. Now to help me control the thickness of my mixture, this is very thick, and then I've got some clear thinner here. And so what I do is I go in and I just add in color over here until I get a fairly thin mix that will flow nicely and fill the panel lines. This gives me the ability as I'm working, if I find that this is too thin, if there's not enough color, I can just add some more color in and kind of customize the mix. Plus, if there's any areas that I really want to hit a strong blob of color, maybe I'm going to streak it or something like that, I can go to this palette and pick up this thicker paint. Okay, I've got that mixed up like I want, and I'm going to get this liner brush, and this is just a cheap nylon brush. I generally use cheap nylon brushes when I'm doing this kind of work. And I'm just going to go in, and I'm just going to start touching that to the panel lines and letting it flow. Now, it's not a real huge contrast and that's what I want. I want these to be a little darker. I want them to be apparent, but I don't want it to be completely stark. Now if, if that's the look you're going for, then hey, do it. Um, that's not what I want to do here. But I just go through and I work and I let it flow. You'll notice it's not super flowy. Sometimes when you get super flowy washes, they flow really nice, but when they dry up, they leave kind of a grainy appearance, and it's, it's really noticeable. So what I try to do is do one that is just a little thicker, doesn't flow quite as much, but it gets better coverage. Now, one of the reasons I do this two palette, this two well system, is when I get to a detail like this raised detail here. Let me focus in on that part in the camera bump. There we go. I'll put the wash around that and it's really kind of thin looking. That's what I want for the panel lines, but for the raised detail I want a little more color. So what I can do is just go in here and touch into this thicker mix and now that the the terpenoid is on there, the thinner is on there, this flows much better and I get more color around that. So working with these two systems right here, or with these two wells right here, I think it's really beneficial in trying to get the color that you want. Because recessed panel lines will hold color really well. Raised areas sometimes need a little more help. 
So working back and forth between these two really helps define those areas. I wanted to show this before I go off into the, the nether regions of, well, let me finish that up and I'll show you what it looks like. These details on any of the TIE fighters along the wings, I love all the little greeblies and things in here. And I've always thought it's so cool that, you know, when you have it dry brushed and painted, it looks pretty cool. But when you start adding in your wash and the detail starts popping out, I mean, this is, this is why I model right here. Because it's fun, in my mind, to see this stuff pop out. To see the details come to life. And the washes really bring that out. That's not super dramatic, I know, but, you know, I love just seeing how that looks when I get the color in there and and it gives it some depth and you can look at that and see all the little bumps and lumps and bits that Bandai packs into this. I, I really... It, it sounds ridiculous because I say over and over, I love these kits, but I really do. They're just so much fun. And if you've not built one, you know, if you've thought, ah, I'm not into Star Wars or I'm not into sci-fi, well, maybe give them a try because these are truly an experience, a journey kind of kit. It's not the destination that's the best part. It's the journey. So um, anyway, I just wanted to show that. And now I'll say I'm going to go ahead and do this across the whole model and I'll show you what it looks like when I'm done. Okay, cleanup of the excess wash is pretty simple. I just go in with a Q-tip and I start wiping it away. That's the beauty of the gloss coat prior to uh, uh, doing the wash is it, it really allows the easy cleanup of the, the washes. Now, I'm not using a lot of pressure because I don't want to get down in that panel line and pull that up. If that does happen, wait until you've cleaned up everything, give it plenty of time to dry, touch in that one area, and then go back and just clean that up. So it's it's a it's kind of a relaxing process. I like this is one of my there's a lot of favorite parts I have in modeling, but this is one of my favorite parts. Um, because it's just a quiet, easy thing to do. Now I gave this maybe about 20 minutes to dry, so there may still be some places that are a little bit moist. If you're cleaning up and you see that as you clean up one area that it streaks and there's a lot more liquid in there, you can just move on to another area that's more dry or set it down for another you know, 15, 20 minutes and let it dry out completely and uh, do, do the cleanup. The more dry it is to a certain point, the easier it is to clean up and less likely, you're less likely to pull stuff out of the corners. You have a lot of working time with oils. So I could leave this. This is, I'm, it's right now about 6.30 in the morning. I could leave this and come back this evening after I get home from work and clean this up. If I wait maybe three or four days, it's going to be a lot harder to clean up. But you see, I'm just, I'm just wiping that away. And I'm trying not to go over the panel lines too much. Again, not so that I don't pull them up. If you do run into any areas that are troublesome to clean up, and I'm not having any problems, but what you can do is get just a small brush and dip it in some clear thinner, dab off most of it. I mean, get it really cleaned up on your towel. And then you just go in and just touch the brush to the area that you need to free that oil up and it'll, it'll loosen it back up and then you can clean it up with that. So, uh, let me get this cleaned up and I've still actually got a lot more wash to apply because there's a lot of little lines and greeblies and things, 
but uh, this again this is this is a fun process so I'm just going to sit here for a while and enjoy it before I have to go to work All right, it took me a few hours to get all the panel lining done and all the cleanup done and more than a few of the cotton buds, but the tie striker is lined uh, and I'm really happy with how it, how it turned out because let me use this side as an example. While the, the dry brushing in and of itself was not that dramatic, the modulation or semi-modulation that I did on the panels with the airbrush is not real dramatic. The panel lines aren't real dramatic. I think when you put them all together, you end up with a pretty cool looking little model. Now remember, this is, this is I talked about I was going to take it to kind of canon weathering or, or how it would appear more in you know, as a movie prop, these tended to be fairly clean. Um, so this is a point that if you're wanting it to look more like a movie prop, this is the point that you would stop. Um, it's just some real basic stuff, dry brushing, panel lining. That's pretty much it. Now, I'm going to spend the rest of the video taking it a little bit further. I'm not going to go um, much further because I don't want to go into the point of it, it looking ridiculous. But this, you could take this, put the wings on, pull off the masking, set it on the stand, and have a good looking model on your shelf. So if, if that's what your goal is, um, then you're there. But uh, the rest of the video, like I said, is going to be looking at adding some more weathering to it. All right, the first step that I'm going to take will be to do a little bit of highlighting to some of the greeblies. I want to go in with just a little bit of a lighter shade than the lightest shade I've already used and I want to paint certain little greeblies just to highlight them a little more. The reason I want to do that is the, the next weathering steps I'm going to be taking will be to add some stains coming from uh, where these greeblies are, some streaks, some stains, and things like that. So I want to up the contrast just a little because I'm going to make areas around it darker. I want to make those areas a little lighter to help them stand out more, to make them features. It's not going to be a lot of parts. It's not going to be every part. But just like, for example, here on this panel, this uh, solar panel, these, these little raised areas, giving them a little bit of highlighting before going in and then adding in some grime, something to represent grease. Because what I'm imagining, like for example here, what I'm imagining here is this thing has to move. Uh, it, it does. It, it, it moves. So I'm, I'm imagining that up in this area there's going to be grease and grime from the hydraulics that actuate that. Uh, these things, if you watched Rogue One, these things were operating on a tropical planet. I'm going to make the assumption that maybe there was rain every now and then uh, or, you know, exposure to sun. So I'm going to be putting some, some streaks that would represent that. And I just want to add in little touches. Now, I want to keep it scale appropriate. I don't want to go over the top and, and make it look like it's a tank. That's not what I'm going for at all, but just something that will in additional ways enhance the, the details around the model. So uh, that's, that's going to be kind of the game plan from here on out. Now you may remember from the second episode of this video series, I mixed up uh, a, some extra color in case I needed to paint this base color on. This is to me a paint. And I could go in and use a lighter version of this and paint the details. However, I'm not a real big fan of brush painting with Tamiya when it comes to little fine details. You can make it work, but sometimes it's a bit of a struggle. So what I did was I mixed some of this Luftwaffe uniform uh, World War II uh, from Vallejo with some Vallejo cold white. What I wanted was a color that was lighter than the, the rest of this, but still had some blue to it. You can mix whatever you, you want 
just, you know, you're looking for something that's going to help you the detail stand out. And I'm going to be applying it with my Wargamer Detail Brush. Um, this is a natural bristle brush. I like painting fine details a little better with natural bristles than nylon, but you can use whatever you want. The main point is this brush holds its point um, really well, and so that's why I like using that. It's not Sometimes when you're painting detail, you don't want to necessarily use the tiniest brush you can find, but often you want to use the pointiest brush you can find. This one's got a nice point, but it's still got enough of a belly that it'll hold some paint, and I'm not having to constantly just dip into the paint and come back, dip into the paint and come back. If you're going to do that, you may as well use a toothpick. So that's what I'm going to use to paint this. Now the details I'm looking for are things like this little raised area because I want to do some streaking down from that. So I kind of want that to stand up. I'll do some streaking from here. It's another one. So I'll run the edge of the brush along that. And on here, basically I'm looking for things that uh, when it comes to like on the side of the fuselage here, things that would catch water and might fade from being in the sun or something like that. I'm also looking for details that I'm going to put some kind of mechanical staining around. Uh, like this area, I don't know what this greebly is, but I'm going to assume there's something moving and that there may be some kind of lubrication going on there. Hydraulic or oil or uh, space gasoline or whatever that these things would have had. And I'm not going to worry too much about, okay, does that make sense? Um, from a canon standpoint. Uh, this is where you get into the plausible. This is where you start saying, okay, based on the physics of our world, the way our world operates, can we make a plausible case that this would be there? Now you noticed I went back to that a second time. This is a lighter coat, but it's also a very thin paint. So a lot of these places I'm going to go over twice to make sure that I get some contrast. Because as it dries, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a little less contrasty, I guess you'd say. But you see, if you look at that, let me refocus, pardon the camera bump. Um, if you look at that from a little more of a distance away, you'll see the contrast that it makes. And it's going to help that detail stand out when I add additional weathering. So as, as I always say, I'll, I'll go around and paint in the rest of this in the model in areas that I know I'm going to weather. If I know I'm not going to do any kind of streaking or staining or something like that, then, or, or if it's only going to be a very small streak, uh, you know, not really noticeable in terms of its, its dramatic appearance, I, I may not add in these highlights just to, just to keep it a little, a little different. But I'm going to go in and add these in and uh, show you what that looks like and then move on to the next step. All right, I finished that detail painting and you can see that uh, I just put in various colors, spots. Uh, some of it is going to be where I'm going to stain like I had talked about before. A few areas as I was painting it, I called an audible uh, to use an American football term. And a few of these areas are highlighted purely for the sake of highlighting. Um, I may put some kind of staining and streaking around them, but some of them I thought, you know, I'm just going to highlight these. So there are a few areas like that. You can see here on the wings, I also did some highlighting there on the mechanical details. I considered highlighting these raised edges all around, but I thought, after I thought about it, I, I figured that might be a little too much, um, make it look a little too contrived. So uh, I focused it right around here mostly where I'm going to be doing some staining and streaking for the mechanical reasons there. So I'll give this a little bit of time to dry and uh, in, in the real world I'm actually having to go off now and head to work for the day. So um, I'm going to let this dry for a while and uh, get back to uh, streaking and staining. For the streaking and staining I plan to do several things. Um, as I think maybe I'd mentioned uh, in a previous segment, I want to do some deliberate stains from some of the mechanical parts so that it, it looks like some kind of fluid or 
grime or grease or whatever, either streaking down or, in the case of the wings, uh, just a general griminess around it where those mechanical parts are. So I want to really, really develop that. But I also want to, in, uh, to some extent, especially on the fuselage here, just introduce some streaking, kind of like uh, if you've seen the, the dot filter video that I did using an ADAT walker as an example, um, it's kind of like that, but I don't want it to be quite as pronounced. I want it to be um, uh, much more subtle. So I'm going to add those in while I'm doing this process. Now, as Providence would have it, I already have some oils on a palette. Uh, this was something I was using on another project, uh, still using it. and. The great thing about oils is because they have such a long working time, I can keep these on here for a couple of days and work with them on a variety of projects. So that's worked out nice. But what I've got here, uh, I'm not going to be using this rust color. That's just a holdover from the other project. But what I am going to be using is this Starship Filth, uh, which is a Ab 501 or 502 Ab Tai um, oil paint. And then I've just got some uh, Winsor & Newton uh, raw umber right here. Now, what I want to do first is I want to apply a, a bit of just the general streaking like I talked about. Now, uh, you can see that I've already been using this brush, so let me get it cleaned off a little bit. But there's, I could do the traditional dot filter and put on lots of little dots and streak them, but I want to do something that I think is going to be a little faster because I want it to be a little more subtle. But what you can do is just work some oil onto your brush, whatever color you're going to use. And using a, a just a liner brush like this, just begin flicking it on there. I'm only letting the brush lightly touch the model. And it's depositing just a very thin amount of paint on there. Now, you can go back to your palette and add more if you want. But again, I'm, I'm looking for a fairly subtle look to this. Now, you have to be careful. I do this, <laughs> I do this quite often. Sometimes you can out-subtle yourself. Um, you can be so subtle that it can't be seen. I want to give that a little chance to dry so I can see how it looks. But I'm going to flip over to the other side and show me doing it again. This time I've added just a little more color so you can kind of see the difference. Yeah, see that's that's way too much there. So if you see that happen, you just go back into your thinner. This is odorless terpenoid here. You just go back into your thinner and just clean some off the brush and do that. Now see I can go back over that and streak that down. And I don't have to worry about that that's a heavy streak. I can even come back later and develop that as a specific fluid streak and not necessarily as the type of streak that I'm talking about where you're just wanting to represent uh, where the paint would fade and where rain would run down and leave marks and things like that. And again, I'm, I'm not using a lot of variety of colors on here. You can use as many colors as you want to, uh, to achieve this appearance. But that's, that's the process that I'll go through. And you end up with, let's look at this side back over here. You end up with some streaking. Well, I think I out-subtled myself. I can kind of see it, but it's a little more subtle than I want. But you end up with some streaking that is very much like what you would get from a dot filter application, but it's much, much faster. It's also a little less precise. Uh, you you don't you don't get the dramatic effect that you do from a dot filter, but again, I don't want that heavy of an effect. So I'm just going to go back and do a few more applications just like that to both sides, just to develop that streaking. And then on the top, I'll do something similar, but instead of streaking, I'll just simply uh, do some modeling up there to give some tonal variation, and then uh, I'll start developing the actual fluid stains. One thing I wanted to point out, when you're working with a rounded surface like this, where 
there's, you know, on the sides, it's easy to just streak straight down. On these rounded surfaces, it can be a little harder sometimes. So what I like to do is turn it at an angle like this. And then I begin my streaks like that in the center, and then I just start rotating it so that essentially what I'm doing is I'm letting the, the, the vector, I guess you'd say, of the brush fit the, ve the, the angle of the curve. So if you think of this as degrees on a compass, here's one degree, and then here's, you know, 90 degrees the other way, and then there's 45 degrees. And if you think of, think of it that way and move it in that kind of direction, then when you look at it from the side, the streaks are going to be appropriate for the angles going down on that shape, which will actually, I think, make the shape pop out a little more. So uh, just a little something to point out there. Now the principal area that I want to add grime on uh, the wings as, as far as staining that would be fluid related is right here where they'll join on, on both sides. The way I want to do this is I'm going to get, whenever I'm working with oils and I'm doing this kind of stuff, I always use old beat up brushes. Don't ever throw your brushes away. Keep them in a jar or something so that when you're doing this kind of work, you can use them and abuse them and it won't matter. I'm going to get some of this raw umber here because it just has an oily look. I'm going to get a little bit on the end of my brush and wipe off most of it. And then I'm going to go in here and I'm just going to kind of pounce it on, um, maybe even on camera. And, uh, and I'm just going to cover the areas that I want to have that mechanical stuff um, staining with with just a little bit of color. I don't want to completely flood the area with it. I don't want to get so much on there that it's going to be difficult to work with as I'm going to show you here in a minute. But I'm just going to pounce that on, get it into most of the nooks and crannies, and if I'm covering up some of the previous highlight work, that's okay because I'm going to show you how I deal with that. But this is the kind of look I'm going for here. I just want it to be a little heavier than what the final look will be. This is not, keep in mind, this is not the final look. But I'm just going to keep working that in getting that into those mechanical areas like that. All right, we'll call that good enough. And what I want to do is take a wide, flat brush that's dry. This doesn't have any turpenoid on it. That other one I was using didn't have any turpenoid either, any thinner. I'm just going to start drawing this down, just pulling those oils down this brush will start picking those oils up, removing them from the surface, and leaving behind a mostly stained area. And you can streak this as long as you want. You can just keep working it like this and working those oils off and working those oils off until you get it how you want it to look. It, it's you decide the griminess. And I'm going to pull it down these panels here so that it will just kind of fade into the panels like that. All right. Now, you may note that now some of that area that I've highlighted has been covered up. Well, what I'm going to do is go back with a brush that has been moistened and thinner. And if I can get it at an angle where I can see it under the camera, there we go. I'm going to clean that off. And you can go around and just clean off some of those points that you highlighted. Now, I could let this dry and go back and repaint those highlights. But I'm, I'm going to work it this way just because it's a little faster. But all I'm doing there is just cleaning off some of those areas 
and you can go in and you can clean areas. You can you can bounce your brush around and kind of develop more. See how that's developing kind of an oily look rather than just a. Uh, you can see the difference in the two sides here. That looks more like oil. Oil has has pooled and and grime has gotten into it, whereas this is just heavily streaked. So you can do that however you want. And then another thing I'll do is I'll go in and I'll get some thinner and some extra color on the brush and I'll just kind of do an additional wash around some of the components. What that's going to do is make them stand out a little more, make them look oily, and this also demonstrates why I chose a different color for the panel lining because if I would have used something uh, brownish then the whole thing would have looked dirty. But I can go in, let's say, to this area right here. I can go in with a little bit of this brown wash and add that in. And even though it's a washed area, it's going to be distinct enough from the rest of it that it will be apparent, hopefully, that it's a stain and not just wash. So by having that contrast, I give myself more options for how the final finish will look. Here's the results of the streaking on the sides of the fuselage, and I'm, I'm very happy with how it came out. Um, you'll note that I left that stain on there because that will represent a little more of a, a streak of some sort. But now what I want to do is I want to go in and I want to develop actual kind of grease stained streaks. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to apply like here, I'm going to use this toothpick to apply some oil. And then I'm going to get a dry brush and I'm going to pull that oil down like that. And just develop little streaks down like that. I need a little more. That didn't streak quite as much as I wanted. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back. I don't want to use a lot of oil, but I'm going to I'm going to help the streak a little bit, just like this. I'm going to pull some of the paint down with the toothpick. There we go. It's one of the things you have to do with oils is because they have such nice working time. There we go. That's what I wanted right there. Right there. You see that? That's what I wanted. Now, if you want to refine the edge, I, I'm happy with it, but if you want to refine the edge, if you get more, if it's wider than you want, you can go in with another brush, dip it in the thinner. Well, here, I'll show it. It doesn't matter. And you can clean that edge. And you can refine the length of it. You can push the oil into it. You can make it look more grimy. So you can work back and forth and just, just push that oil around until you get the streak shaped like you want. This is, and I know I sound like a broken record, but this is part of the beauty of the flexibility of oils, is you can, you can develop things all day long. Like I think there's probably going to need some really good streaking here. So I'm going to get this and I'm just going to run some oil along like that right there at the edge. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to streak down like that and then pull it a little further just like that. Now you can get bonus points if you go in here and you put some extra dots of color between those just to give additional tonal variety. If it's too heavy, if you think that's more than you want, pull it back up the other way. Just like that. I mean, that's grime. <laughs> so it's a, it's a fun process. Uh, it's, it's really hard not to go overboard with it. Um, but it, it, it's, it's something that, that oils, and, and really only oils, you can do this to a certain degree with enamels, um, acrylics not so much, 
but oils just really make this work. So I'm going to be doing a lot more of this, but basically what I've shown you here is what I'm going to do over the entire model um, and try to do some, show some restraint so that it doesn't look too beat up. But I'm liking the look of this, so uh, we may just end up with a really beat up TIE fighter. All right, well, after getting all of that oil applied, uh, I'm going to call this guy done. You can see that I've got this area very grimy here where those mechanical pieces would be working. I got a little bit of grime here. I left it off over here so much uh, just because, you know, I'm imagining this one had some kind of leak and this one doesn't. Uh, on the, it's kind of hard to maneuver around. On the undersides and on the sides, you can see where I got that oil in and the streaking. The wings do move, but there is a tendency when they move to split this top thing open. So I have to be real careful with that. But you can see how the sides look. And just continued that along the underside. And what I showed in those, those brief clips of, of me just pushing and pulling and dragging the oils. That's what I did over the whole of the model. Um, not the entire surface, but everywhere you see it, that's what I did. So uh, it's, it's pretty grimy looking. Yes, it's more grimy than you see them in the movies, but we can carry these as far as we want to. And this, this shows that, you know, there's a basic paint job, then there's kind of a cannon paint job, and then we can let our imagination go a little free. I could take it even further if I wanted, I suppose, and do some chipping. I chose not to on this one, um, but do some additional chipping. So there's, there's a lot of ways to take this. But regardless of which model you're building, whether it's this TIE Striker or a TIE Fighter, an Advanced TIE Fighter, a TIE Interceptor, any of those, the things that I've shown in this series of videos will help you get uh, a good result and uh, should help you have fun building that model. Well, thank you so much for watching uh, this video and uh, hopefully this series. I hope you found it uh, entertaining and beneficial and useful. And if nothing else, that it maybe helped you uh, along your way towards a good nap. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. And uh, thank you very much to the patrons who support me on Patreon. I'm so thankful for what you do and how you support me. And that makes all of this possible. So a very special thanks to all of you. There is a subscribe button down somewhere over here. So if you're not already a subscriber, I would be most grateful if you would click that button and click the little bell icon so you'll be notified when I do put out a new video. And there are links down below to the various social media platforms that I'm on and also to Patreon. And so I would be most grateful if you would go and take a look at what's offered there. All right, with all of that being said, as always, I want to remind you that in this hobby, if you're not having fun, you're doing it wrong. Happy day to you, friends. Bye-bye.